molecular scanners for smartphones are making their way to an iPhone near you. Telspec is easy to use. I simply wave the Telspec back and forth, and within a few seconds, we should receive in our smartphone some information about this salad. Now I'll scan this apple. Let's see what it says. This apple has no pesticides. Uh, no. Unfortunately, debunking this one has turned into an act of passion. But it's also taken a little longer than I expected, so hopefully it'll be ready in a few days. But until then, enjoy a happy little tour of the incredible machines that mankind has actually made. And a few of the uh, sci-fi ones as well. Hey, hey, so here's a question for you. How do you get one of those guys inside one of those guys? So this is a quick video about some of the ideas I've got for upcoming videos. It still amazes me that, you know, that's actually the size of the people. This thing really was based around two people standing up in the very front of this thing. You know, the two lumps on the side, well, which is there and there. Uh, the fuel tanks are getting back up. Almost everything on the back is a computer. Um, yeah, and that's the only bit that lifted off the moon. <clears throat> and above it, we have the two and a half ton truck, which, though you might not think it, was actually a really pretty decisive weapon of war. So down here, we've got a load of the tanks, both Axis and Allies of World War II. Um, and that one is the one that basically was the key ally tank, the Sherman. And that one is the, the Russian version, which is the sort of T-34. And they were inferior in almost every way to things like that, which is the Tiger. With the exception that there were a lot of them and these guys. But of course, having a lot of tanks is useless if they don't have supply. Which is basically what this thing was about. Now this one's a GM truck, but it was the Studebakers that the Americans sent to Russia that really had to stop the Russians from collapsing. In fact, this is an interesting one, the Sherman tank. What does the Sherman tank have in common with this guy, who is the Spitfire, the Mustang, the de Havilland Mosquito, and the Lancaster. And the answer is they had very similar engines. Now the, um, I think it was General Motors again who made the actual engine for the Sherman, but it was an aircraft engine very similar to the Merlin that powered all of those planes that I just showed you. And on this side we have some sci-fi stuff of the same era that were of when men, men landed on the moon. So that's Space 1999, which was just after men landed on the moon. And that's UFO, which was kind of similar vintage. But they're both on about the same scale, and they're both on about the same scale as these guys down here. So the spacecraft design, especially this one, it, it got some stuff right, although the rest of the science on Space 1999 was abysmal starting from the very premise of the show which is the moon's blown out of orbit by a giant nuclear explosion <coughs> can't happen anyway so what else we got uh, we got some rocks uh, most interestingly is this guy who's actually just rock salt it's salt you actually sort of lick it it's it's salt from an ancient seabed or something um, and the thing that's interesting about it is it's blue and the reason it's blue is because it's been irradiated so when the salt actually crystallizes and there's radiation nearby the radiation can knock some atoms out of the crystal and you get these things called colored centers in there then you got here the trilobite with the amazing trilobite eyes, which are actually made of calcite, just that stuff. And oh, some elements, let's do some elements. That's bismuth, silver, gold, 
platinum, copper. That's the actual gold that was poured onto the potato. That's carbon, actually, most notable in the form of diamond. And some dysprosium salt, which I've long since forgotten what it is. And that is older than the Earth itself, or at least the patterns on it. It's actually part of an iron cord meteorite. And the ogre, ogre tank, because they always looked cool. Hunter killers, of course. The Battle of the Planets, the Phoenix. As I remember from when I was a kid. That's the first toy I really remember as a kid. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's kind of dated. This guy is quite fun. The thing about the trilobites is they had some fantastic body variants. So this down here is one of the spiny trilobites. Not only do they have the awesome eyes, they also have this, some of them have these really quite incredible mouth parts. And there are others which have stalky eyes. I've got a stalky eye one somewhere. And that's vanadium. And behind it is zirconium which I'm at some point going to set on fire just to show you what happens when a nuclear reactor catches fire. And these beautiful little cubes here are pyrite, iron sulfide, which you can actually burn. It's sulfur dioxide, if you're keen. And below it is actually one of the original contractor models for the lunar module. So that guy there and the two next to it are all on the same scale. This is the de Havilland mosquito which is remarkable in that it was sort of the world's first stealth fighter. Completely made by accident, of course. Uh, it was actually made so almost unexpectedly by a piano maker. Um, the military didn't really plan to make it. Um, there was a piano maker and he wanted to do something for the war. And so they started making these wooden planes and then they put two of these Rolls-Royce Merlins in it. And the thing was bloody fast and very maneuverable which made it a superb reconnaissance craft. The Spitfire was very important for the Battle of Britain. This was the one that really won the air war over Germany. And the thing that really makes it is that air intake on the bottom. Anyway, uh, the, the air intake there, that big, uh, allowed it to sort of supercharge um, the, the engine and gave it much better performance at altitude. And so that again is the Mustang. And so the Mustang and the Lancaster there had the same engines in. And next to it is the, the, the these were the two mainstay bombers for the air war over Germany. Uh, the B-17 Flying Fortress was the one um, of the Americans and the Lancaster of the British. Lancaster carried about twice as many bombs, but was nowhere near as heavily armed. And... <laughs> prioritised dropping bombs on Germany over, really, the crew safety. It was a different kind of war. The B-17 was another sort of rushed into production type thing. That's what it looked like when it was done properly, which is the Super Fortress. This thing was pressurised, and therefore, uh, the, the, this was an unpressurised cabin, and it flew bloody high, which meant it was absolutely freezing. And loads of people getting frostbite in these things. And underneath the, all these guys here are on the same scale. And that's the B-25 Mitchell there of Doolittle Raid fame. And continuing, going into space, here you have the alien dropship and a V-1 flying bomb on the same scale as well as Voyager 2. And behind it are mankind's real spacecraft of, well, of sorts. That's the Mercury capsule, which you get in an office chair, that's about the size of the Mercury capsule. It was tiny. Gemini wasn't much bigger. And by the time you get over to Apollo, it was three guys sat down in there, which is still pretty pokey. And it's had a spirit or opportunity. So the rockets that they launched the uh, the Mercury on uh, are these two. That's the Redstone and the Atlas. 
And for perspective, that's the V2 on the same scale there. And then next to it is what they launched all the Geminis on, which was a Titan. Titan missile. It really was just literally a converted intercontinental ballistic missile with a capsule on top of it. <clears throat> and then there's a factor of two scale difference to when you get up to the Saturn 1B here. And these things were launching uh, command modules here. And that's the Saturn 1B, the space shuttle, and the Saturn V on the same scale. And just to show you what an absolutely massive craft this thing was, here you have all on the same scale. That's actually a guy. The V2, which of course what the Germany used to bomb Great Britain. Then the Redstone, which was quite literally almost exactly the same design as the V2 with bigger fuel tanks. And then next to it, not quite the same design, was the Saturn V, which is an absolute beast of a rocket. So that's the whole thing. So that there is a German Mark 7 submarine. And they very nearly defeated Great Britain in World War II. And the thing that's amazing about it, well, first of all, they could sink capital ships. They were more than capable of actually sinking capital ships like this. In fact, one of them actually sank Ark Royal at the back there, the aircraft carrier at the back. Um, but eventually they were defeated because things like this started coming on the scene, which is a Fletcher class destroyer. And also other things like aviation in sea power. And this is sort of part of it. In fact, this, this guy here, the old string bag, the swordfish, was absolutely a game changer. In fact, the route, the route to Pearl Harbor really started with these guys. Because early in World War II, Britain sent one of their aircraft carriers with <laughs> swordfish torpedo bombers over to bomb the Italians. And the Japanese studied this very well and basically used it as a template for bombing Pearl Harbor. Um, and of course, at the time, they managed to destroy a, a load of battleships like, uh, actually not like this one, this is a much more modern one. It's an American battleship, the Missouri. And of course, the Japanese Yamato. Anyway, the, the battleships weren't so important by then because yeah, it really had sort of shifted uh, air power, um, it shifted naval power to things like aircraft carriers by then and that's of course the Hornet loaded up with B-25 Mitchells which is what it did the first bombing raid on Japan in World War II. That behind it is the Douglas Dauntless which was really what won the Battle of Midway in about five minutes. Uh, incredible story. And that, of course, rendered things like this, which were uh, modern battleships at the time, almost obsolete. And that behind it is the Caspian Sea Monster on the same scale. It's an incredible ground effect craft made by the Russians. Here we are back at the de Havilland Mosquito, right next to a German Mark 7 submarine and a Wildcat, all on the same scale. And if I come out a little more, there's a space shuttle also on the same scale. And some Mad Cats, Mad Cat 2s on the same scale. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and a, a truck. Yeah, that's the these, these trucks that were really instrumental in, in World War II. And so in the Pacific Theater, that's what the Americans started off with as fighters. And they, they were okay, but they were completely outclassed at the time by that guy, the Zero Fighter. Now, later on in the war, there's a whole bunch of factors that basically made the Zero obsolete, and fighters like the Corsair next to it basically ruled the sky after that. It's amazing to see... Yeah, the, 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 the space shuttle was almost a flying submarine. Stand by for liftoff. Have the docked service module and lunar module 
the thing that stuns me still is that that was the only space that people could actually live in. <laughs> and the command module could take three people sitting down and a lunar module about two people standing up and that was all you had to kick you to the moon and back again. 